Yes, sir. Is this consistent with a strike to the nose? Yes, sir. If this was the first strike of the fight, would it be, a, as you testified, a significant maneuver to control the ebb and flow of the fight? Does that object is calm and speculation? Based upon his experience and training, Your Honor. But you're showing him a picture of something else, so you need to ask a different question. Rephrase it. Yes, Your Honor. The, uh, you talked about your criminal justice degree, correct? Um, but you talked earlier about the police academy. I want to see if there's any difference between the two. In your training, well, it's going to be difficult, but because you, you got your criminal justice degree after you started training as a law enforcement officer? Oh, yes. I pursued my degree okay. well into my career. I'm going to try and separate the two. Did you learn any of your striking techniques or resistance techniques or takedown techniques in school for your criminal justice degree, or was just that in the academy and your further law enforcement training? There was no physical courses like that required in my criminal justice degree. The criminal justice degree is geared toward more to educating you about the criminal justice system, about the courts, the processes, and things like that. Um, the academy is about applying the enforcement of the laws. Think what laws are to be enforced, how to enforce them, physical ways to enforce it, how to conduct traffic stops, how to conduct everyday business as a professional law enforcement officer, whereas a criminal justice degree is kind of like the, the bookend, if you will, of criminal justice. It's the how the system works in and of itself. And um, having done it for now, I guess, 20, 25 years, did you enjoy being a law enforcement officer? I did. I enjoyed being a police officer very much. You think that it was, for you, a noble profession? Absolutely. Would you encourage or discourage, say you had a 20-year-old nephew or son, would you encourage them or discourage them from taking on a life of law enforcement? Depends on the child. I have uh, a stepson, for example, very physically fit, and I would encourage him without question to pursue it. My daughter, on the other hand, who doesn't like confrontation, who doesn't like that, I would not encourage that. But anybody who really wants to make a difference and is able to take on the stressors of that type of position, it's a very noble career, and I would re recommend it to anybody. In, um you had mentioned um, early in the conversations about sort of the continuum of force um, that a certain act can allow a response. So if you say to me, go over there and sit down, and I go, no, or even more colorful words, then you get to respond verbally. Is that sort of part of what we're talking about? That's a piece of it, yes. Okay. So, um, and that continuum of, of force sort of goes up the scale all the way and ends at deadly force, correct? Yes. Okay. And, and are there markers along the way that allows you to increase your response to force? Absolutely. So let's just say that I walked up to you and pushed you. What would an appropriate increase in force be based upon your training and experience. I'm going to object as to relevance as this relates only to police officers. I'll broaden it. I want you to answer the question based upon your experience as an adult, based upon your experience as a fighter, and based upon your 20 years of law enforcement experience, and also based upon your expertise in looking at use of force events. <clears throat> So with that context, let me ask you a couple of questions about that. When you look at use of force events, does that go across the spectrum of use of force? Yes. Okay. We're not just talking about, you don't just specialize in use of force of deadly force, correct? No. Use of force is force, whether it, it starts from the very beginning from verbal communications and goes all the way up to and including deadly force. It's a, 
it's a very wide playing field. So if you were aware of a situation, one of your, um, I don't know, cadets or one of your people that you would end up helping to train, where they were just using inappropriate verbal force, screaming too loud or doing whatever, would you then counsel those people? I, I guess, maybe I'm not saying you know, it right. Yeah. Let me try again. Um, when you do your use of force training within your experience, both law enforcement and as a trainer, does that include training law enforcement officers and whoever wants to be trained as to how to use even verbal force, where you use the command voice? All of our force training, whether it's law enforcement or for individuals, the idea behind any level of training related to force is to explain the variables involved in deciding how to apply force and what justifies it. If somebody's being verbal, obviously we would recommend to them that if possible, our number one recommendation for everybody, if confronted by an aggressor, is try to avoid it if you can. But it all depends on your environment, your ability, the ability to leave, the ability um, sometimes people don't give you the opportunity to leave. Sometimes they could be yelling at you from 40 feet away. So all of these variables come into play. So when you look at each event, you have to take into consideration all of these variables. So if I was yelling at you and cussing at you from 40 feet away, my recommendation for you would be just to, you've got 40 feet walk away, clear the area. If I'm up personal, in your personal space within six feet, three feet, within arm's length of you, and now I'm getting that same hostility and everything, and I'm very animated, now that verbal confrontation becomes a, a more significant issue for you because of the distance that we've closed. So really it's, it's very difficult to answer A and B because the totality of everything comes into play when you consider when and how force should be used. Okay, so going back to my question I asked a moment ago, if we were outside in the courthouse and I walked up to you and pushed you on the chest, what would your response be? My objection, Your Honor, again, as relevance and speculation. That was where I laid the foundation, Your Honor, as training experience. Overruled. My personal response, if you shoved me, I mean, again, we're taking this just you walked up blind and pushed me. I would take a position of advantage and give you strong verbal commands and make sure that it was very clear to you that you made a mistake. Would you punch me in the nose? Objection, Your Honor, Mr. Relevance and speculation. Again, his training and what level of response he would have. But you're asking him what he would do in a situation just just at that. I'll move on, Your Honor. Move on. If I might just have a moment. Mr. Root, you would agree with me that your understanding of what was happening at the exact moment of the gunshot comes from one person and one person only, correct? Yes. So your opinion that there was another option is based on the words from his mouth, right? No, sir. Did, My opinion did you that he didn't have any other Sorry, options. Or, you could be allowed to answer this question. My opinion that there was no other options was based on the totality of his training background and experience. The options that you're referring to really come into play based on what you're capable of doing, not simply just because this event's happening, you have another option. Don't, don't the options also depend on what the other person is doing? In this case, Trayvon Martin? Well, absolutely. So your determination as to what Trayvon Martin was doing at the time he was shot came from him, right? That was one of the elements that I considered for that, but when you take the small portion of weight given to a statement and then you add in the other evidence that surrounds the event, the injuries and everything, to see if it corroborates it to a point that it, it seems plausible that this exactly is what took place and everything lines up to say yes, based on what I see here physically, the injuries and so forth, this all makes sense. So the opinion is that based on what he told me, in combination with all the other variables involved, that's how I formed my opinion. Yes or no? 
Do you know what Trayvon Martin was doing at the moment he was shot? Yes. You do? You're asking my opinion. Based on the information I was given the opportunity, just like I could look at you and say, I don't know what Mr. Zimmerman was doing, I don't know what Mr. Martin was doing. If you're looking for me to say that I don't know if Trayvon Martin was doing this one specific thing, we're talking about the totality of how I formed my opinion. But you're asking me about what was he doing at that time. It appears clear through the evidence. If you want me to just surmise and say that, well, based on your perspective, he wasn't doing this or George Zimmerman wasn't doing that. I don't want you to surmise anything. I asked you a very simple question. Do you know what Trayvon Martin was doing at the moment he was shot? I personally was not there, so I cannot attest to specifically knowing exactly what Mr. Martin was doing at the time. I can only base my opinion on the totality of the evidence as I've learned it throughout my exploration of this case. Which, include, which includes your perceptions, or, or his perceptions as he told them to you, right? Didn't you say the defendant's perception is important? The perception of an individual involved in any conflict is what you have to take into consideration when making a forced decision. So the perceptions, if I told you I had a perception that the Jolly Green Giant was jumping on me, that would be ridiculous. But if I was in this booth right behind here and said I had the perception that one of these wires were wrapped around my ankle, it was plausible. The perception is taking in the totality of the event as it unfolded to see if the perception that was related by Mr. Zimmerman was plausible. Right. The perception that was related by him. Absolutely. Yes, right. sir. And your conversation with him came about two or three months before his second degree murder trial. Right? Sure. I, that sounds about, about accurate. Yes, sir. Um, you were asked about testifying. Um, this isn't the only time you've ever worked in a criminal case, right, for, on behalf of a defendant, is it? No, sir. I mean, you've been consulted on plenty of cases on behalf, on, in, on behalf of defendants, right? You're going to have to qualify that a little bit more and say you have a bunch of cases on behalf of the defendant. Right. Have you ever been retained, hired by a defense attorney to testify or consult with on behalf of a criminal defendant? A criminal defendant, um, I believe, retained. It's in my curriculum vitae, so I don't want to misspeak this. Twice, maybe, I think. Um, one would have been, I think, the Chambers case, and the other one would have been where I consulted, did not have to testify either by deposition or in trial. Um, I, the name of the gentleman is escaping me, but it's toward the bottom of my CV. This is just the first time you've testified in front of a jury? Yes, in, in a criminal case in this way, it is the first time I've done this, yes. And you mentioned um, the continuum of force, uh, the force continuum, that applies to law enforcement officers, right? The force continuum is a conceptual model. It's when you look at use of force, if you looked at Florida state statute, that's a continuum. It's a systematic, systematic approach to the escalation and de-escalation of force. The use of the words continuum came out of law enforcement, yes, but the actual application of the concept is regardless whether you're in law enforcement, you're in the military, or you're an individual on the streets of you know, Orlando. A continuum is still part of the conceptual variables that you consider when looking at a use of force event. You were asked about um, getting punched in the nose. You don't know when George Zimmerman was punched in the nose during this uh, confrontation, do you? No, he was punched during, obviously repeatedly during the, the event. The exact time that the injuries to the nose were sustained, I couldn't tell right. exactly. And, and it may have not been from a punch even, right? Didn't you say earlier it could have been when he hit it on something else? No, I never said that. I never said that George Zimmerman hit his face on anything else. Could, could it have been caused by something other than a punch? In this event, I'm not aware of anything else that was present to have resulted in that injury, so I'm... Okay, you're not aware of the concrete? I do not believe that a facial contact of that nature with concrete without seeing other types of abrasions to the face and the eye areas, because when you're talking about the force significant enough to cause that damage to his nose with an impact on a flat, hard surface, you're going to have continued rollover, which is going to increase injuries in some area around the face. 
and it was pretty clear that the abrasions around the eyes or anything like that, so I wouldn't recommend the, the position that concrete caused that nose thing. Well, well let me ask you this. You've been, you've been punched in the nose before, right, during oh, the fight? Absolutely. You didn't quit, did you? I didn't quit? Right. Did you keep fighting? No, I'm a fighter. So you, you kept fighting? Absolutely. If you're a fighter, you, that's the whole purpose of entering into a fight is you fight. Okay. And you've seen other people continue to fight after they've been hit in the nose, right? I have seen both. I've seen people that when they've been struck, it exits the fight right there. The fight continues, but they are not con able to respond in any form or fashion. And then I've seen others. And I, I mentioned earlier about the warrior mindset. Not everybody has that. So when you look at an individual, if they're involved in a physical altercation and they don't have that internal fire to be involved in that way, they're not going to fight. And when the fight starts, they're going to be that person that's just beaten. Where conversely, if you have somebody that's got the warrior mindset and they're struck, they're going to return in like fashion. And then you have two individuals with the same mindset going about one another and you have tremendous damage to both persons because neither one of them is going to stop. All right. My question was, have you seen people who have been hit in the nose during a fight and they keep fighting? Yes. Okay. Um, Mr. O'Mara got on the floor here, and I got on the floor, and we did this little demonstration. You kept using your hands like this, like got to be 90 degrees, right? The two bodies, isn't that what you did? I was trying, considering you were on the floor with a mannequin, I was trying to use my hands as trying to best relate that I could that just being in this position, this position, when you talk about 90 degrees, we're talking about maintaining a level or an alignment in some ways that puts them in a position. So when you talk about leaning back, maybe Mr. Zimmerman's coming up, but when you had the mannequin in that position, you weren't maintaining that same alignment, so the, the 90 degrees that you were referring to wasn't possible from what I was seeing, so I was trying to visually use to show that, you notice when one hand turns, the other hand turns, at some point they were in this alignment that enabled them to have that type of entry wound. Okay, well, in fairness, haven't we left something out? That is like the wrist and the hand and the arm? Can't that move independent of the body? Sure, right? but what you're talking about there is you're, you're now wanting to say that it's this. Is that what you're saying? Well, I'm asking you, if I'm laying flat on my back and somebody's over me like this, can I not shoot them at 90 degrees even though I'm on my back? Because can my you? Yes, but you know, when you also look at it from the perspective of actual discharging a firearm, if you try to hold any firearm and then hold like this to shoot, it's going to become much more complex. The average person isn't sitting there trying to do this, and they don't do it like you see in the movies where they hold it gangster style. The idea is when they draw a firearm, it's put to work in the manner in which it's drawn, which is by grip. So could he have taken the gun up and angled his wrist this way? Anything is possible. That doesn't make it plausible. Okay, well, tell me that. Tell me what's not plausible about this. If I'm laying down on the ground and somebody's over me at any angle, I can always make it 90 degrees, right? I mean, it can be 90 degrees here, it can be 90 degrees here, it can be 90 degrees here. It depends where the other person is, right? Everything depends on where you are in relation to that other person. It also depends on where the firearm is in relation to that other person. When you talk about the discharge of a firearm, and you talk about, and if you've done any kind of shoot, if anybody's done any kind of shooting, you learn very rapidly that the wrist position is not exaggerated. Why? Because that's not how you shoot. It takes very much conscious thought to remove yourself to put it so that you're at another position. Is it plausible? It's possible that the wrist was moving, and I'm not trying to say it's not possible, it's just highly unlikely. It, so it's possible you can shoot somebody almost at any angle because we have arms and wrists and elbows, right? It, Anything is possible, yes. You were asked a question, um, I think, before the lunch break about, um, was it your opinion that George Zimmerman's uh, And I heard Mr. Zimmerman mentioning Mr. Martin in the recording where he was facing him. My perception of that call at that time, I sensed stress in his voice about the fact he was approaching him, looking at him, his hands was going toward his waistline. As he left, that tension diminished. That to me also reinforced what I've already heard from Mr. Pollock and um, saw from, again, reviewing the information in this case, he's not the confrontational one. He's not that I'm going to get on you type. 
when Mr. Martin ran, is what basically he's running, there's no immediate threat to him. His perception is he's taken off running, so he gets out, and that's where he is now trailing or following, I would say following the person, to see where they went because that's what he was doing for them. Well, didn't you hear the defendant say, I don't want to give up my phone number because I don't know where he is? Yes. Doesn't that indicate to you that he still might be a little concerned about what's going on? Mr. Zimmerman? Yes. Oh, absolutely. You know, but I mean, when we look at it that way also, when we're talking about timelines, if we're thinking about the T and he took off running to make it home, it's my understanding home wasn't that great a distance away, considering his age, how come he wasn't able to make it the exact distance. If he's still in the area, it's presenting a concern for Mr. Zimmerman because he, he's lost complete sight of him. He's not running it at the end of his distance, even though the visual acuity is minimal because of the darkness. So now you're looking at an individual that is walking back and he's uncertain as to whether or not he's actually still there, so he doesn't want to give out his phone number. Let me ask you one more question about the firearm. Are you aware that the defendant was trained by a federal marshal how to shoot? Um, yes. You also said um, that interviews, you feel like an interview is better if it's delayed? Not all interviews. We were talking about the use of deadly force, and the comment was made to me about, for example, using references for law enforcement. It is a common practice to delay the interview because of the known uh, memory loss issues and to extend the time before you conduct a thorough investigative interview of a police officer. But that's not what you, go ahead. My interpretation when I was asked that question is it just seemed reasonable that if we extend that courtesy to law enforcement, it can be extended to anybody. But that's not what you did as a police officer, right? I mean, when you arrested somebody, a suspect for a crime, you didn't wait a couple of days to interview them, right? Didn't you interview them? Well, of course them right not. There? Of course not. Because the idea is, and I mean, to be very honest, when you're a police officer, you're told all the elements of the crime to the best of your knowledge. You're given the discretion to make a decision as to whether or not an arrest is warranted, and you base it off the facts that are known to you at the time. So when you ask for an interview and you're interviewing a bad guy, if it happens to be a homicide, which I have investigated homicides, if it if it happens to be a homicide, you're going to go in right away. And if the individual says, I want a lawyer, they're getting their period of time where they're not going to have to talk. That's their lawful right. The investigator doesn't wait. The investigator goes ahead in and tries to get whatever information he can. But he also uses the totality of the circumstances that he finds himself in so that he forms his questions. And he makes a determination based on those interviews whether or not an arrest is warranted. But I wouldn't wait three days unless there's no rush to make the arrest. And you're aware that the defendant spoke with his friend, the best friend that I've asked you about, about eight hours after this event? It's, it's, it's conceivable, yes. And just to be sure, just to be certain, you're not an expert in memory retrieval. That's not what you're telling memory us. Memory retrieval? No, right. sir. No. May I have just a moment, Your Honor? Direct? Just on the new issue that was addressed, one, one issue. You had talked about this warrior mentality, a warrior mindset. Yes, sir. Um, can you give the jury any insight based upon the evidence in this case as to whether or not Mr. Zimmerman evidenced a warrior mindset or not? Based on the information I received from what probably one of the most important persons I talked to with that regard was Mr. Pollock, the gym owner. And his description and everything about Mr. Zimmerman was not one to enter in the ring. He was not confrontational. Everything that I've reviewed in this case would indicate the opposite. He was not the type that had what we would refer to as a warrior mindset, that, that inner fire that compels you to be a fighter, that compels you to be that person that wants to get in the ring to test your skills against another person. Was there anything about the, but for the gunshot, the lack of injuries on Mr. Martin that um, helped you with that decision? Based on the, the injuries that I, we've all seen for Mr. Zimmerman and the lack of injuries on Mr. Martin, it, I would take that as evidence that he didn't have any striking. He, 
even though he's on the ground and in this tussle, it, he did not do anything of any significance that would have been able to even result in an injury to a man. So that would support, again, the same information that I already derived from another source. He didn't even land a strike, at least one that left a mark, did he? he there doesn't... So there's, that is called for speculation. Sustained. Um, how about any evidence gathered from this event that suggested that Trayvon Martin did have a warrior mentality or mindset? That is beyond the scope and um, in violation of the motion. My response? The same as to the violation. Uh, it, the door was opened, Your Honor. It was this prosecutor that asked that very question. I'm just asking him to focus. And you've already asked your questions about that, so I think that... I'm now on. asking about Mr. Martin, not Mrs. Zimmerman any longer. I, my objection, the, my ruling remains sustained. Yes, sir. <clears throat> was there any evidence in the case that you've looked at that would suggest that even through the 45 seconds worth of screaming that the uh, attack stopped? Judge, I'm going to object to that as calling for speculation. Well, he asked him if he was aware of any evidence overall. No, I saw nothing that would indicate that to me. Thank you. Nothing further, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. May Mr. Root be excused? Subject to recall, Your Honor. Okay, thank um, you very much, sir. You, may we approach on the issue of recall for a moment? Just. We can address that later, but I will tell him you're subject to being recalled. And then we'll address the issue about recalling later. Um, you're excused from the courtroom today, but you're subject to being recalled. Um, please call your next witness. I just have a moment to yeah. talk. Okay, thank you. Call your next witness. Ms. Bertolon. Swear affirm that your testimony in these proceedings will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you, God. Thank you. Thank you. You may proceed. Thank you. Got the name, ma'am. Could you state your name, please? Olivia Bertolin. Okay. And Bertolin, if you would spell that last name. B E R T A L. A N. And um, at one point, back in February of actually 2000, early 2012, did you live in the retreat at Twin Lakes area? Yes. Have you since moved out? Yes, I have. Okay. Are you married? Yes, I am. And do you have any children? Two. Okay. And their ages? Two and a half and four months. Okay. Um, going back then to um, when you still lived at Retreat View Circle. <laughs> Did an event happen at your residence uh, where a crime was committed? Yes. If you would explain to the jury what happened with that. Um, I was home on a Wednesday with my son. He was, I think, nine months at the time. And um, I heard someone ring my doorbell repeatedly. So I went to check upstairs because I didn't have a peephole. And I saw two young African-American guys um, ring my doorbell repeatedly and they kept on looking up at the window and I called my mom because I didn't know what to do and they left then after a while I went back upstairs to check one more time and they're walking in front of my house one came towards my house and um, I called my I was on the phone with my mom at the time and I started crying and I called the police they broke into my house I heard some bangs downstairs um, the dispatcher told me to grab any weapon I had because I had my son in my arms, he had woken up, and um, just prepared to use it if I had to. The, the guy was, ring, um, I was locked in my son's bedroom, and he was shaking the doorknob trying to get in. 
And I was sitting there with a pair of rusty scissors and my son in one arm. And um, they, the police came and they ended up leaving. And um, do you recall approximately when this happened? August 3rd of 2011. And did you then take a place of refuge or hiding while this was occurring? Sir, yes, I did. And where did you go to hide? Um, my son's upstairs bedroom. In the closet? Um, I wasn't in the closet. I was in the far corner because the closet was closer to the door. Um, so she said to get away as far away from the door as possible. And did you have your son with you during that time? Yes, I did. did when um, did the, the people who were downstairs at some point, did they leave the house? Um, yeah, once, did I they, guess they escaped before the cops got there. And did they take any items with them? Yes, they did. What did they take? Um, my camera, our laptop, they tried to get our TV, it was unhooked, but he had it hooked up to our computer so they couldn't get it off. Um, I think there was something else, but I can't remember what it was, but definitely our camera and my laptop. And. Um, at some point, then, one of those people, or at least one of those people, were um, arrested and found and arrested and charged with that crime? Yes. And um, do you know what happened? Do you know the person's name? Um, his name is Emmanuel Burgess. And um, is that the reason why you moved from that area? Yes. Nothing further. Thank you. Just bring it back. Ms. Berlin, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, you had some contact uh, with George Zimmerman after that event, did you not? I did. Okay, and? Direct, uh, um, outside the scope of direct. Judge, it's, it's um, the basis of her testimony, I believe. I would have to definitely proffer at the bench. Well, we can't offer to the bench, ladies and gentlemen. If you'll please put your notepads face down on the chair, call the deputy Jarvis out of the courtroom. Please be seated. You may do your proffer. Ms. Berlin, I believe you said um, that this crime happened to you on August 3rd, 2011. Yes, sir. Did you have contact with George Zimmerman that day? I did. Okay, when I say George Zimmerman, I'm referring to the gentleman seated at the end of the table to my left. Yes, Correct? Sir. Yes, sir. All right. He came to your house? Yes. And he, um, he gave you his phone number? Yes. And the reason he came to your house, as he described to you, was that he had heard you had been a victim, right? Yes, sir. And you talked to him about it, correct? Yes, sir. You described uh, the people that you saw at your residence? I believe so. You described them as two, two people, as opposed to one? Yes. As males? Yes. As black? African American, yes. As teenagers? Yes. I said they looked young. And. That wasn't the only conversation you had with this defendant about that case and you becoming a victim, right? Right. Um, is it correct to say that you and he talked about this approximately 20 times after that? Probably around there. I'm sorry? Probably around that amount. And you discussed with him the fact that the person had not yet been caught? I'm sure I did. I spoke to several people about it. And um, the person wasn't caught until after you moved out of the retreat at Twin Lakes, right? Um, he was arrested in December. Um, then he was released because he was a minor, and he was arrested again after we moved out. After you moved out? I believe so. We got a letter after we moved out. I'm not sure the exact date of his arrest. And another thing that you and George Zimmerman discussed was where you believed or he believed that particular suspect lived, right? I'm sure we discussed that. And you discussed that he lived um, near the back entrance of the retreat at Twin Lakes? Yes. Your Honor, I have other questions for, but they don't relate to her contact with the defendant. Okay. So 
that would be the extent of the proffer, uh, I, I believe, is what was objected to. I withdraw my objection. Okay, thank you. Let's go ahead and bring the jury back. Please be seated. You may continue. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Berlin, I believe you said um, this incident happened to you on August 3rd, 2011. Yes, sir. Okay. That day, did you get a visit from a man named George Zimmerman? I did. All right. And he's, is he the gentleman seated to my left at the end of the table? Yes. He used to live in your neighborhood, right? Yeah. He used to live in your neighborhood. Oh, sorry. Yes. And he actually came to your house that day. Correct? Correct. I need you to just speak Sorry. out loud. And he talked to you. He, the reason he came to your house, he didn't know you, right? Right. He, he came to you because you had been a victim of something, right? Yes. And you described for him what had happened to you um, that afternoon. Yes. And you described to him the people that had victimized you, right? Yes. And you described the number of people? Um, yeah. How many did you tell him? Two. And did you describe the sex of the people? Yes. And what was that? Male. Did you describe the race of the people? Yes. What was that? African American. Did you describe the age of the people? I didn't know the age for sure, but I'm sure I told them I assumed they were late teens. They looked that age. And um, after that, you and he continued to talk about that very case, right? Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. Okay, approximately 20 times, is that fair? Yeah. And you and he discussed that the person or persons involved had not been caught, right? Right. And you discussed that it was your belief, and I say your collectively, you and him, that that person responsible or in Virtuia Twin Lakes near the back gate, right? Yes. And then it's your understanding that at some point um, that person was arrested? Yes. And released uh, prior to February of 2012? Correct. You, um, have you watched the proceedings in this trial? Briefly. What, what parts did you watch? 
Um, I believe I saw um, his uncle testify. Who else? Um, I don't know any by name. But I haven't watched very much. Have you tweeted about this case? I, not since. No, I have not. Not since, since what? Since maybe last year when it first happened. You haven't tweeted about this trial? I don't believe so. This week? I don't believe so. You, um, you do have a Twitter account, correct? Yes. And you follow, um, you actually follow Mr. O'Mara, do you not? Yes. And you follow uh, a, uh, an account or a site called Zimmerman Legal Case, right? I do. And you have um, been on Nancy Grace? Yes. In regards to this case? Um, I, over a year ago, yes. I have just a moment, Your Honor. Ms. Berlin, thank you for your time. Redirect. Thank you. Just a few follow-up questions, ma'am. Mm -hmm. When uh, Mr. Zimmerman came to you to talk to you about having been victimized by a home invasion, did you consider that strange? No. Were you appreciative of his efforts to help you out? Very. Tell, tell me about that. Um, we were terrified <laughs> when this happened, and when we came home after we were having car troubles, and we came home, and he was just saying that he wanted to make sure we were okay. We weren't home, my sister was, um, and she didn't answer the door because she was scared because of what had gone on. Um, so I was just appreciative that he was offering his hand and had told me I could spend time with his wife if I needed to go somewhere during the day because I was so afraid. He told you that his wife, Shelley, was a nursing student, correct? Correct. No objection has to hear, sir. Did he tell you, what did he tell you about his availability, if any, of his wife to be there for you if need be? Did object to that as to hear, saying relevance? It's... Well, I, I'm really having a problem with the relevance. I was just following up, but, okay, Your Honor, I'll just focus it again. Um, were you aware that Ms. Zimmerman was there for you as well, if need be? Yes, sir. Did you then at some point shortly thereafter go to the Homeowners Association and discuss the issue of the home invasion? I don't believe I went, my husband did. Okay. And then, uh, in, in addition to your conversation with George Zimmerman, did you talk to other people about um, what happened to you? Yes. Who is that? Um, a couple of my neighbors, a neighbor named Pete, another neighbor, Chris. Was this um, home invasion then something of a point of conversation because of the, the trauma that you had with it? Yes. Matter of fact, did Mr. Zimmerman, after the Homeless Association that started Neighborhood Watch, did he bring to you a, a lock to help you with the sliding glass door? Yes, he did. Did you consider that weird or unusual or strange? No, I was very appreciative. Were you made aware that there was an issue with problems with the sliding glass doors in your neighborhood? I don't believe so. Was it actually how they got in the house, the sliding glass door? Or another yes. One? So they actually came in through the back sliding glass door? Mm -hmm. Did yes. this lock then help secure that problem? Yes, it sits behind it and it locks it tight so they can't pull it open. And before um, you moved out, you even had, what, didn't you get a dog to help? Yes, we did. Was that part of trying to just stay more secure in a neighborhood where you've been burglarized or invaded? Yes, the cops told us to get a dog. You know the person who arrested, who, who was arrested was Emmanuel Burgess, you said? Yes. And that he was released? Yes. Did you know that he was rearrested on February 6th, of 2012? I didn't know when. I got a letter after we moved out, um, so I, I didn't know exactly when he was arrested.
did any of your interactions with Mr. Zimmerman in this regard leave you with some impression that he was just just too involved in trying to help you out? No. Did you think that his behavior was helpful to you? Very. Still have the dog? Yes. <clears throat> Thanks very much. Nothing further. Thank you. May Ms. Bertalan be excused? She may. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. You're excused. Please call your next witness. Uh, defense would call Robert Zimmerman Sr., Your Honor. Your testimony proceedings will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, sir. State your name, please. Robert Zimmerman. And um, live here in Central Florida, correct? Yes, sir. How long have you lived in Central Florida? Almost seven years. Okay. Uh, you know, you know George Zimmerman as your son, I imagine. Yes, sir. Okay. Understand, of course, he's here on a second-degree murder charge. Right? Yes, sir. I'm going to limit my questions to you to an event where you had an opportunity to hear a uh, what we have been calling a 911 tape or a Ms. Lauer's 911 call. Um, do you know what I mean when I ask you about that? Yes, I do. It is a, um, is a tape that includes in it some screams and a gunshot. Have yes, you heard sir. that tape? Yes, I have. We have it available. Um, the jury has heard it dozens of times now. I'll only play it for you if you need it to hear it again, but do you have a memory of it such that you remember listening to it and forming an opinion as to who you heard? Yes, sir, I do. If you would just tell me the setting or the circumstances around the first time that you heard it. I believe the first time I heard it, it was on the third floor of this building. Uh, it was in the state attorney's office. I was there, I was put under oath. They asked me some questions. As I was getting ready to leave, uh, they asked me what, if I would mind listening to this tape. I said, certainly. So they took me in a fairly small room where there was a computer. They provided me headphones and they reminded me I was still under oath and would I listen to it? I said yes, so I listened to it. And uh, then they asked me, did I recognize the voice? And what did you tell them? I told them, absolutely, it's my son George. Is that an opinion that you still have through today? Certainly. Nothing further on. Thank you, Cross. Good afternoon, sir. Hi, sir. I think you've listened to it six times, is that correct? I'm sorry? I think you've listened to that recording six times, correct? No. You have not? No. Okay. I may have a moment, Judge. Yes, ma'am. I've listened to it a number of times. I have no idea if it's six or... Oh, okay. I would probably say at least six, but I... More than six times? I at would least, guess at least six, but okay. I, I really... Thank you very much. ...can't be accurate. 
Thank you, sir. Okay. Any redirect? No, thank you, Your Honor. May Mr. Zimmerman be excused? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. You're excused from the courtroom, subject to being recalled, sir. Thank you. Call your, sorry. Call your next witness. I think this might be a good time for a break, if I might, Your Honor. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we'll take a 15-minute recess. If you'll please put your notepads face down on the chair and follow uh, Deputy Jarvis back into the jury room. Um, is the defense going to be calling any other witnesses? Um, no, okay, so after the recess, I'm going to ask Mr. Zimmerman about whether or not he wants to testify. But at this time, Mr. Zimmerman, were there any other witnesses that you wanted your attorneys to call on your behalf, sir? No, Your Honor. Okay. For this hearing? For this trial. For the trial. You, you've been here through the trial, and we've had... Um, Let's see, we've had 40 witnesses that were called by the state and 19 witnesses called by the defense. Some of them were called, I'm sorry, I'm talking to Mr. Zimmerman. Okay, some of them were called a, a couple of times, such as um, Ms. Singleton, so it, it, it's really less than 19. My question to you is, Mr. Zimmerman, were there any other witnesses that you wanted your attorneys to call on your behalf at this trial? No, no. Okay, thank you very much. When we get finished with the recess, I'm going to ask you about whether or not you're going to testify. Yes, so sir. take the time you need to talk to your lawyers. Thank you. Thank okay, you thank you very much. Court will be in recess.